Welcome to the Sasquatch Outpost podcast, episode 50. And true to form for being episode 50, we've got an awesome guest tonight, my good friend David Polites, and I'm going to bring him on in just a minute. But I appreciate uh, everyone being here tonight. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. Hit the like button. Um, if you want to sign up for any of our events this summer, camping, night hikes, horseback riding, hikes, and camping, you can do that through our website and by clicking on Rabbit Hole Adventures. Um, I was just on the phone today with the coordinator of the Estes Park Events Coordinator talking about Bigfoot Days in Estes in April. And um, in the afternoon, we're going to do something kind of unique. Um, we're going to record a podcast, one of my podcasts from Bigfoot Days. And I'm going to interview one of the casts from um, Expedition Bigfoot on that recorded podcast. And then we'll show it the the two days later on the Tuesday after Bigfoot days. But um, amazingly, they don't hold Bigfoot days at six in the evening on Tuesday. So can't do a live. <laughs> um, just got back from England. I was there for 10 days with my wife visiting her 95 year old dad. He's um, doing pretty well for being 95. Daphne is still there. She stayed on uh, for a few more days to be with her dad. But um, I, I did a couple of things that I wanted to show you guys real quick uh, before we bring Dave on. So um, I went out one day with a friend of mine, um, and we were driving through the countryside. And you can put that up there, Steph. So <laughs> this is how all the roads are, right? In the countryside, they're this narrow. Obviously, they they drive really small cars. But the next slide, you can't you can't drive uh, this car, this vehicle, <laughs> on the next slide on this road. Um, I wouldn't be able to pass anybody. I would block the entire road with my truck. There's no question. Um, then we were we were driving along and I, I looked to the side and I see this field, all right, with these sheep. So I, I tell my friend, oh sorry, this is every wall, every property in England, everywhere in the country has these walls and they're all dry stacked. There's no there's no cement, there's no mortar, they're dry stacked, all of them, all across the country. I've never seen so many walls in my life, all dry stacked. Um, but we, we came across this, I think the next slide, we came across this field. So I see all these sheep, I mean, way back there. So we slow down, we stop <laughs> next slide. The sheep go, huh, what's going on? And the next thing I know, they're all at the fence. They came from the whole field I guess they figured we were stopping to, uh, to feed them something. But the best part of this trip was, uh, at the last, the day before I left, I got to go on a VIP tour of this aircraft, the Concorde. Incredible aircraft, decades ahead of its time. Uh, you can just go through these real quick, Steph. Look at the design of this aircraft. It's it's the, in my opinion, it's the most gorgeous aircraft ever designed. And uh, this is how tall that plane is from the ground. Um, incredibly tall. And these are the engines, had four massive engines. Um, the plane could fly across the Atlantic in just under three and a half hours at 1,350 miles an hour. This is me flying the Concorde. But um, they, the amazing thing about this plane for being what it was and what it could do was this is the cockpit. Look at this old yoke. All analog instruments, no digital, nothing digital in this plane. Built in the 60s. And uh, unbelievable 
for what that plane could do. And, and they had one accident in Paris that actually happened when we lived there. Um, everyone was killed, unfortunately, but that's the only accident the Concorde ever suffered. And, um, the, uh, I have to do something here real quick. <laughs> I have to get something back up on my screen. Just give me a second. Um, I need to find it. This is frustrating. Stephanie was saying, okay, Jim, you got five minutes. You got three minutes. You got one minute. And I couldn't get it in time. So let me do this real quick. Um, Because this is important. Okay. This is what we're going to be talking about tonight. So I need to put this up here. My mouse died one minute before broadcast time. And so I'm having to do this on my, on my touch pad. Um, come on. Where's now? I can't find it. I tried to do something really clever. And I can't find this picture of Dave's book. Well, I'm not going to take any more time trying to find it. Um, I'll have Steph get um, look up. Dave, is your book? Um, let me bring Dave in real quick. Please welcome with me David Polites, my good friend. And... Um, Dave, is there somewhere Steph can get a copy of your book? Probably on your website to bring up and put on the screen for us. Um, can't you find a copy on North America Bigfoot? Yep. Uh, you can come to our website, NA, like North America, nabigfootsearch.com. Go to the online store and you'll see it there. And Jim, I got to thank you for using that segment that we recorded here at the ranch where I was rounding up the cows. And you used it on your entry. That was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, actually, what what I had, what I was trying to do right before uh, last famous last words. Don't ever try something right before you go on live. But uh, when we were at Dave's house two summers ago, that's incredible. A massive storm came in, and uh, Dave and I were sitting on the back porch and. We see something that I swear we thought we saw something in the storm um, that maybe it was a ship or something, but um, it, we didn't have binoculars to get a good view of it, but there was something going on in that storm. And I've seen too many videos of UFOs hiding in storms to, to think it wouldn't have happened in that case. But uh, I have known Dave for, shoot, let's see. Probably, well, since we since we opened the store, um, I'm, I'm Dave. You're gonna have to bear with me. I have to tell this story every time because it's such a funny story. But so Dave used to live about 30 minutes from here, from my house, and from the store down in Morrison. And um, I don't remember how you found out that we had we had started we had opened the store, um, because you reached out to me first. I don't remember how you found out. Do you? I think someone told me and asked okay. me if I had heard about it up in Bailey. And I said, no. And they said, oh, you got to go up there and talk to this guy. So so Dave called the store, asked to speak to me. I wasn't there that day, which when, never happens, right, Steph? I'm always there. And, <laughs> and um, so he called back again, and I didn't know who Dave was. And so um daphne said uh, that fellow who wants to get together for lunch called you back and i said well i guess get this guy off my back i want to have to meet him so <laughs> dave comes up and we get together and have start to have lunch at the cafe next door and we're we're 30 minutes into the conversation and i asked dave hey you ever heard of this series of books called missing 411 then there's this pregnant pause in the conversation dave goes yeah, I wrote them. And I said, 
can we go 30 minutes back in conversation and start all over again? Because I'm an idiot. But he was very gracious. And uh, then I realized who Dave was. So, um, but we've we've been friends ever since. Um, we've organized several conferences together and been fishing together and done a lot of things. So, Dave, uh, appreciate your friendship and appreciate you being on tonight with me. This is a real, a real privilege to have you and um, to be able to talk about your newest book. Let's put it up here on the screen, Steph. Hot off the press, missing four hundred and one Washington State series. Literally hot off the press. Just came out January thirtieth, right or thirty first. Yep. So, and this is book ten. Am I correct in that? Twelve. Twelve. <laughs> you, you didn't pay me enough for this, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> book twelve. I remember when we first met. You handed me, and I still have it here. You handed me the complete series of four books in a in a box. Remember, they were all bound together. Um, and uh, that that was a long time ago. Four books was a long time ago. A um, lot of water under the bridge since then. But when I'm when I'm when I talk to people and they find out that uh, we know one another, um, inevitably the question comes. We can take that down, Steph. Thank you. The question comes. So, what does Dave? politis thinks happens to all these people who go missing and so since i have you on the show tonight i'm going to ask you that direct question and i know what your answer is going to be but so dave what happens to all these people who go missing you know when a researcher or an author puts their foot out there and says something is fact or they think this and then years later it's proven not to be true the credibility of that individual kind of goes down the drain right but i'm i'm not one that's going to back away from facts and probably our latest documentary missing 411 the ufo connection is is a step in that direction i just couldn't ignore that anymore and i lay out a series of incidents in that movie yeah. that some people may say well that's hard to believe but when you look at all of the instance instances that I've wrapped together, you start to see lineage between them all. And I think it's even federal documents showing that these UFOs are in areas they sh really shouldn't be in. Hmm. It's hard. It's, it's really hard to ignore. If, if you guys have not seen missing 411, the UFO connection, um, you need to watch it. It's, um, it's hard for me to say, I mean, I love the hunted so much. Uh, I love I loved all the films, but um, this one was excellent and it's got some crazy stories in it. Um, the, my favorite is the the craft coming in <laughs> over the herd of elk and picking an elk up and flying off, but miscalculating and knocking up against a tree. Wasn't that what happened? Knock the elk up against a tree and then kept going, but just shows you that alien craft are not um impervious to making mistakes uh but yes um obviously people want to assume one of two things that that you would say they're all these people are all abducted by aliens or bigfoot one of those two and um even though well, jim, you have evan jim, jim what if what if what you just said was one in the same <laughs> good question and and that is um yes bigfoot could be alien they could be alien um and they could be responsible for for missing people my my response to people when they ask me is if do you think bigfoot is responsible for a lot of these disappearances my answer is they could be but all the researchers I know across the country and all the people we've all taken into the woods for decades, 
I've never known a researcher to go missing. And so, nor anyone that they've taken with them. I certainly haven't. And the likelihood is, the probability is, to me, if Bigfoot was responsible for abducting people, not saying it never happens, but um, if they're responsible for a majority of these cases, surely the people who are out there the most at night, us researchers, would have been abducted by now. Somebody. Um, and it just hasn't happened. And so I can only speak from my own experience. Um, if I thought I would be abducted or one of my guests would be abducted, I couldn't take people out. Um, so there's just too much risk, too much liability. And, and for several years, I didn't take people out because that's what I was afraid of. But over, over the years, I finally became convinced that that wasn't going to happen and it hasn't, but, um, but yeah, the, the whole UFO connection was fascinating. And I, I was, um, when, when, when you did the premiere and I went to be with you guys afterwards, we had dinner and you asked me what I thought of the movie. And I told you, I thought it was a great movie. And I said, um, uh, you know, Dave, if uh, the next thing you're going to have to do is is create another movie with all the other theories of how people disappear, whether it be, you know, what are the options here? I mean, aliens, Bigfoot, abduction by people. Um, uh, I suppose an abduction isn't the only possible reason why people disappear. I suppose some of these people... Um, died of natural causes and then were just never found. Um, their bodies were never found. But um, <laughs> nice hat, yeah. Um, which hat is that? Is that UFO? No, this is a new hat we just came out with. It says Liberty across the top, and there's a bald eagle, just like on the bald eagle on the front of the book. Oh, cool. Har Guess who did the drawing, Jim? Harvey who? Pratt. Did he? He did. He did the artwork. Where's my, where's my cap, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> um that's cool i'm glad harvey did that harvey's a a great friend um i know you you guys have been close friends for a long time um but you know all, all all these different options who knows and it's probably not one thing in fact i'm sure it can't be one thing it's a combination of reasons why people disappear but um Obviously, Washington is a state with massive numbers of people who've disappeared. I didn't count. I didn't count the, the cases in your this particular book. How many do you have? Do you know offhand, Dave, in this book? There's over 90. 90. Um, and we were talking before the show and and. Several that I want to talk about are related to children, and you asked me why is that. And the reason is, obviously, I have grown kids now, but I can't, I can't imagine anything more heartrending than to lose a child in a bizarre manner, like many of these cases are. And and so it, those tug on my heartstrings, and and there's quite a few in this book on children about children disappearing in Washington state. Um, and I picked a few here. Do you mind if we just, um, jump in Dave and, and start talking about some of these cases? Well, why don't I start out with Jimmy Duffy? Yes. Let's talk about Jimmy Duffy. He was on my list as well. So Jimmy, uh, was a two year old boy that was considered at the time, possibly somewhat retarded. That was the words used in, October of 73 when he disappeared and his mom and his dad loved the outdoors. He had a sister that was a couple years older and the family had a pickup truck and camper. And they went up to a place called little Wenatchee Ridge uh, deer hunting. And they pulled the truck in there and there was nobody in the area. This is still one of the most remote areas you can get into in Washington. And the family, parked the truck and Mr. Duffy first went out on his own, did some hunting. Mrs. Duffy stayed behind with the kids. 
He came back after a couple hours and then the wife said, Hey, let's you and I go take a walk. And they put Jimmy back in the camper with the daughter and their cat. And, and, the, and the daughter was little younger, was she? Or older? No, no. She was, uh, I think, 12 months older than Jimmy. Okay. And so the family, the husband and wife close the door and they just walk like in a 100, 150 yard radius around the camper in a circle. And as they're walking, they're keeping their eye on this camper the whole time. And there's nobody else in this area. There's no other campers, trucks, no hunters, no nothing. Well, they walk behind a grove of trees for like a minute. And they hear a scream coming from a direction of the camp camper. They run and within seconds, they can see their camper and the back door is open on it. Both of them take off running on a sprint. 100, 150 yards to the back of the camper. They look inside, and here's the part that is very <laughs> odd. I agree. The daughter is still asleep, and the cat is still asleep. And they heard the scream from 150 yards away, and the door is open now. They look around. They can't find Jimmy anywhere. Well, Mr. Duffy's a hunter. He looks around, There's and there's a dirt base all around the truck. And he says that there's no tracks. Hmm. So he says, well, Jimmy's got to be right around here. We're less than, you know, 30 seconds or, or a minute from this happening. He starts looking around. They're calling Jimmy's name, screaming Jimmy's name, nothing. Now, a little two-year-old is not going to run that fast, even if no, you got out of the truck. No way. No way. But the other thing was, is that that scream, it was never explained in any of the reports about whether they thought that was the scream of Jimmy or something else. So they search, they search. Hmm. Finally, they decide after several hours that they need to, they need more help. So they contact the Forest <clears> Service. <throat> now, let me stop here for a second. So I, I first hear about this report after going through some archives. So I, I contact the Sheriff's Office for that area. And I ask him for a copy of the report. And they said, yeah, we'll get back to you on that. Yeah, pretty, pretty common response. And after a couple of weeks, I don't hear anything. So I, I get back with them again. And this is at Chalen County, Washington. And I get a hold of the supervisor for their records department. And she says, Dave, I'm embarrassed to tell you, we lost those reports. I go, what do you just mean? For, just for Jimmy. For this entire case. Yeah. <laughs> I go, how could you lose them? She goes, I don't know. And she goes, it, can you work with me that we can put this case together? Because we need to he, we need to have one because he's still missing. I said, yeah. Uh. So I work with them and we kind of get a case file together. She puts me in contact with some people that have retired, but have still worked the case. Make a long story short. Eventually, Chalen County gets there and the Forest Service gets there. They mass a massive search for a week. In the middle of the search, one of the detectives from the county pulls Mr. Duffy aside and says, we think you killed your child. You probably shot him by accident. And your oh wife is gosh. covering this up for you. I'm thinking, I can't believe these guys did this. Yeah, what a horrible thing. To so the Duffy's, of yeah. So the Duffy's say, no, we didn't. And, and they said, well, then you need to come down and take a polygraph for us. They said, we'll do anything, but let's focus on finding my child. So at the end of the week, they bring him down and Seattle police bring their polygraph investigators and they polygraph both the husband and the wife separately. And the Seattle detective came in and said, you guys need to look for a new suspect. They didn't do it. They have no idea what happened to their child. Hmm. So talk about some humble pie. Yeah, for sure. Well, this went on. They searched for Jimmy. They didn't find him. Now, to me, what's important about this is that the canine should have found that boy. No problem. They should have found tracks on this kid. Uh, the cat should have woke up. And anyone who's had a cat knows. Yeah. Um, what do you think, Jim? Yeah. I mean, cats, um, we've got our cat and we've got my 
daughters, two cats. We got three cats right now. And it's amazing. I'll be sitting in the living room watching TV or something and I'll, I'll drop something on the ground and all three cats go like this boom, straight up in the air because it's an unexpected noise that they, and they, they, they run and then they turn around and stop and look and see what it was. But for a cat to just sleep through a scream, um, amazing how, you know, some, it's almost like the cat was, was, drugged or something i mean it was it's weird so there's and, um, and and the sister nothing i mean just sound asleep and remember jimmy was described by friends and relatives as being quote unquote retarded at the time so his ability to move fast or his ability to get away would not be relevant to something like this they said he was frail right. and small but uh that's a case that to this day, people still talk about up there. There's a, a person from search and rescue that contacted me about this case and, a, and another incident not far from this one. And they said that that area, that little uh, Wenatchee Ridge area, very remote, makes them feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And they said that the description of what happened to Jimmy just doesn't make any sense. Well, and by the way, as, as, as usual, any of you have any thoughts or comments or whatever um, for Dave, just put them on the chat and we'll try and get to them. And um, yeah, the scream, the scream is the weird thing in this one, Dave, among other things. But the fact that that's a, it's a great question. Could it have been something other than Jimmy's scream? Um Outer limits, the inheritors, huh? Well, so what that person just posted, special needs children are abducted by benevolent aliens. In several of the talks I've given, I talk about profile points in the books uh, that fit what we're researching. We don't look at all missing people. If they don't fit the profile, we're not going to look at it. One of those profile points is people who disappear have disabilities hmm. or injuries that we you can't see by looking at them. Now, in this case, Jimmy had that. He was disabled. And a lot of the people that we talk about are diabetic or they have something right. else. And in talking to people way smarter than me, they bring up that point that that person just posted. Well, maybe someone is studying our DNA and they want to see what happened within that process that caused mm. this person to get that way. Did the parents think it was Jimmy screaming or they just heard the scream? It was never clarified. Oh, I mean, I mean, many of us wouldn't necessarily know that kind of scream coming from our child because it's a, if that was Jimmy, it was a scream of maybe sheer terror or, um, but yeah, I, when I was reading through this, didn't even occur to me that maybe it wasn't his screen. Um, but they heard it a hundred yards away, over a hundred yards away. So, um, it wasn't just a little child waking up from a nap and, you know, crying. Um, it was loud enough for them to hear. Uh, yeah. I mean, so many times children are found in some of the cases we're going to talk about, they're found. Jimmy wasn't. And um, what a heartbreaking thing to be accused of killing your own kid when all you want is to find them. And another one, let's let's talk about Bobby Pankinen. Um That's that's another weird one. <laughs> um, so, Bobby, th that is probably one of my top 10 cases of all time as far as strangeness, uncomfortableness. Um, Actually, Angie and I went to that scene about a year ago. And really? uh, yeah, it happened at a place called Deep Lake at the far northeast corner of Washington, right near the Idaho border. Did you and get Bobby, to the actual spot where it happened, do you think? We didn't find the waterfall, but we were on the road okay. that he disappeared off of. Um, 
he was four years old, August 3rd, 1963. And his dad had just retired from the Air Force. Why is that important, Dave? A lot of people ask me this. Do you have many victims whose families are associated with the armed forces? Hmm. And if you're a fan of the X-Files, you, you kind of know why that question keeps coming up. Well, Bobby and his brothers were with their family and they left their home about three hours away and they went up to Deep Lake. Deep Lake is this place in the middle of nowhere, gorgeous setting. I can imagine in 63, there was probably almost nobody. Yeah. And the older brother went with the dad fishing on the lake and mom took the two younger brothers and Bobby with her down this lonely dirt road, maybe, you know, 500 yards from the lake. They walk down the road because they are told that there's a waterfall down there. And Bobby's going along and he's not wearing shoes. And they get to the point where there's a small path, maybe 25 feet to this waterfall. And the mom says, you wait here because this is really a rocky area. Just wait here. We'll be right back. She goes right in the middle of the road. Sits him right in the middle of the road. Yep. But that this is a super rough road. <laughs> this isn't something is you'd even that you drive your nice Cadillac down, Jim. Okay. Well, uh, I mean, he's barefoot, so he had to get down this road one way or the yes. other. But it was a slow pass. Yeah. So they go down. They look at the waterfall. They come back. The mom says it couldn't have been more than a few minutes. Bobby's gone. There's no place to go. Look both ways down the road. They never heard anything. They never saw anything. Very odd. So the boys that are with him and the mom look around. No car came down the road. Nobody was around. Eventually, they get back to the lake. They get the dad, and a search starts. And he was just wearing a swimsuit, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he wasn't wearing anything to get off in the bushes. I mean. No. No, no. And this is a big, big search. Uh, it lasted over a week. Uh, this is probably, I'm going to guess, 10 miles from the Canadian border, maybe five miles from the Idaho border. Uh, really, really remote today. And when you think about it, hmm. what, are, what are the options? The options are mountain lion. No, he would have screamed. There would be blood. There would be evidence of a struggle, drag marks, none of that. Right. A bear, same thing. Scream, drag marks, nothing. Uh, person-to-person abduction, no. Too remote, too out of the out of the way. Nobody was around. Nobody would have even known they were going to go down that road. So. No, exactly. So what are the options? Well, even... As recently as a few years ago, one of his brothers ended up being a captain for the fire department hmm. and he was interviewed and he said, you know, it's one of the one of the saddest moments of my life, but I could never reconcile what happened to my brother because of how quickly it happened. Hmm. Nothing heard, nothing seen, nothing smelled. Did he say what he thought may have happened? He didn't know. Yeah. But that I, I will say this. <laughs> That the backside, meaning the forest area behind the waterfall, went towards a location where I actually did a Bigfoot conference not too long ago, a couple of years ago, which is why Angie and I went to this location. And that mountain there, there's nothing there. I mean, it's remote, no paved roads, no nothing. And uh, yeah, the Pankinen case is something that's always disturbed me. I mean, I mean, aliens is certainly a possibility. Um, the Native Americans have a long history, oral history of children being taken by Bigfoot. Um, so I suppose that's a that's a possibility. But I mean, to happen that fast and the kid not make a noise and no dust. So there wasn't a car. There was no, they would have heard probably even 
somebody running through the bushes carrying him, but he would have yeah, he's four years old. He would have yelled or screamed or or fought. I'm sure he would have fought if somebody had grabbed him and tried to run off with him. So um unless he couldn't. So yeah, I mean just and and I'm sure um when your kids were little, Dave, I don't know if this ever happened. I, I remember two occasions where we thought we had lost one of our kids. Once was at um, Disneyland, and and my eldest suddenly wasn't there. And she wasn't far, and she was smart. She stood where she was. She didn't go anywhere, and we found her. But And then another was at the Coca-Cola Museum in Atlanta. And both times, my um, heart missed several beats as I thought, where are they? Where are they? Where are they? And who took them and who grabbed them? And, you know, I start to get frantic before we found them. And I can't imagine not finding them and what that must feel like. Um, I think there are multiple things going on in the 411 cases. Some cases, people vanished without a trace. Others, the dogs can track, but the person is not found. This is true. Um, the yeah. one consistency... 95 to 98 percent of the time in every story in my book books is that the canines can't find the victim now right. i worked for a municipal police department for 20 years i worked on the swat team for a portion of that time and we had the canine unit attached to us so every time they went out on looking for a felon we were always the backup and we would go with them i've said i've stated this before i've never been on a search with those canines where we didn't find the suspect or a uh, victim that was missing. So when I first started to hear that these canines weren't finding people, it didn't make any sense to me. It still doesn't make any sense to me. Well, and in, in the case of Bobby and um, Jimmy, neither one was ever found, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Never found. Now, one who was found, there was a there's a couple here that I found fascinating. Um, her name was Marcella Ramiski. She was four and disappeared in Mount Rainier National Park. Um, it's on page 67 of the book. And um, her mom took her up for a picnic and then she just disappeared. And um, let's see, is this the one? July 1st, yeah. 1950, 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The interesting part about this case is I've researched thousands of missing persons and the average median time that people go missing is 4 p.m. She went at <laughs> 5 p.m., two miles from the base of Rainier. And she got away quickly. Uh, National Park Service brought in tons of people, canines and the weird thing is she's found by somebody that wasn't directly related with the primary search and she was found 16 hours later canines missed her and she's found with her dress on backwards oh i, didn't, her, I didn't notice that yeah and uh her shoes were all tied like uh, some crazy person tied them they said and her mother stated, oh, yeah, every night she takes her clothes off and goes to bed. The problem oh. I, I wrote about in the book is that the temperatures at that time of the year around Rainier get pretty cold. And a yeah. child taking off their clothes and getting naked and sleeping uh, at four years old, I don't think so. And she was and, found and, quite a ways up on the, on the slope of the mountain, wasn't she? Two miles, yep. That's correct. She was found outside the scope of that primary search. 50 rangers, two bloodhounds. They looked for her, and somebody even <laughs> not related to that primary search found her up on the side of the mountain. And I, I stated in the book that kids usually walk downhill. She was right. Found up. And, and why walk away from your mother, for one, unless, you know, she was trying to get away from her mother, but there was no indication of that. And and walk uphill two miles for a four-year-old it's just insanity i mean um to think that these kids do this by themselves is crazy 
Now, one of the things that I included in the book, Jim, was I think you got it was the map. Yeah. Now, the reason I, I like maps personally, because I'm a visual kind of person, but Mount Rainier National Park is a center post for missing people in Washington. It's, it's the largest cluster of missing people. Hmm. And they still happen today. I mean, just recently, we've had missing people there that weren't found. And why Mount Rainier? Well, you'd think, well, maybe they were mountaineers and they fell down in a crevasse. I try to stay away from those cases. I wrote about one case where a mountaineer disappeared up there. But the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of these are people just like you and me hiking around the base that disappear. Mountaineers, you kind of think it's not surprising that one of them disappears because of what they're doing. Um, but yeah, people like us, we're not trying to scale the mountain, um, the way a mountaineer is. Um, but the, another kid that was found was Ricky Craig. He was five and, um, he was another Huckleberry. Uh, I think he's on page 82. He was another Huckleberry um he's at least the huckleberries old. were ripe um five yeah, years they were old. Picking them. yeah august 15th 1957 they were about 25 miles south of mount adams i should say something about mount at mount adams that no if nobody knows some of the strangest aerial phenomena in north america happen around mount adams hmm. and his family was picking huckleberries uh they lose sight of them and why huckleberries? Well, yeah. there's a chapter in several books about people who disappear that are picking berries. And the number one berry that people disappear are picking is huckleberries. And if you've never had a huckleberry, it's hard to explain, but they're all <laughs> over Montana. And Angie and I go out and pick those. And Angie makes a great huckleberry pie. And we freeze them. And over the years, we have one a month, say. But if you're keeping your head down all the time and you're not looking around, something's going to happen. Uh, as an example, a couple of years ago, we were picking huckleberries and I'm looking and I hear something and down, down the trail is about, I don't know, 400 pound black bear. Yeah. Not, not 50 yards from us. I said, Ange, come on, <laughs> we need to move away from here. <laughs> but, uh, a lot of kids disappear with their parents when they're huckleberry picking and huckleberries are a primary food source for a lot of the animals out there in the woods during that time of the year. I mean, you guys probably have them around your house, don't you, Jim? You know, I've, I've never found, I, maybe I don't know what a huckleberry looks like when it's ripe, but um, we probably do, but I, I couldn't point out a huckleberry bush. Um, blueberries, blackberries but what are huckleberries what color are they well when they're ripe they're kind of a reddish purplish kind of thing mm. but um anyhow ricky disappears big search 200 searchers that's the start point they get up to 600 searchers and then he's five years old and the search and rescue manuals say that he should be found within two to three miles well, he's found again by somebody who was missed by the canine team and he's found five miles away. Yeah. That is a long way in the woods. Yeah. Folks. <laughs> As Les Stroud once told me, he said, Dave, if somebody says that they're found five miles away, they didn't walk five miles point to point. No. They walked at least double that to get there. Because that's crow as crow flies five miles. Yeah. And, but they're so doing this. Out, survive, you know. Right. Survivor man. He says, no, you don't walk a straight line in the woods. Um, so this this I'm a five year old kid. You can you can imagine, and Steph, I'm gonna have you put some of these comments back up in a minute, but you can imagine, I can imagine a kid berry picking. There's lots of berries. He wanders a little far away from his parents and he can't he can't find them again or something but to end up five miles away there's no you know his parents weren't <laughs> they weren't miles away from him they were right there and so um yeah the the 
Huckleberry thing mystifies me, and you mention it quite a few times in your books, and um, and it's adults too that go missing picking huckleberries, not just kids. So absolutely, um, there was a comment from one of our Australian um, listeners about they have reports from Australia of people waking up outside their home with their clothes on backwards, <laughs> or yeah, here we are. Um, woken up outside of their house with their clothes on back to front. Um, which so I should say something here, Jim. Yeah, I have a YouTube channel and it's called the Can Am Missing Project, like Canadian American Can Am Missing Project. Go to YouTube, 680 videos are there, and I've done a lot of cases out of Australia about it and a lot of cases in the U.S. I post a new segment every other day, and they're just about missing people. And uh, Angie and I went to Australia, had a great time, did a book tour there. People there are super friendly, and there is a lot of strange cases mm. that mimic what's happening here in the mm. States happening there. And what was the other comment somebody mentioned? Clothes being on or pajamas being on. Uh, UFO abductees waking up and their PGs are on backwards or inside out. Um that's or true. wasn't even wasn't even their own clothes they were wearing. So I, I realize some of the people that are here don't know me, but I'm, I'm probably a mile wide and an inch thick. Uh, one of my backgrounds is that uh, I'm a UFO investigator for MUFON. And I've been doing that for 14 years. So I've read hundreds and hundreds of abductee reports. And just what this person said is true. A lot of the abductees said that they come back with their underwear on backwards, clothes on backwards. And one other thing that's said is that there's been many times where an abductee says on the ship, they see a biped that looks like Bigfoot. Yeah. Acting subservient to the people on the ship. Have you ever heard that, Jim? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've heard people say that they, they, heard or were communicated by the aliens that the Bigfoot were were created to be kind of the manual labor force for the aliens. Um, they certainly are strong enough to be able to do whatever manual labor you need them to do. Um, it's funny that these people talk about this. I remember as a kid, I never thought about this till right now. I remember going to bed in my pajamas and waking up fully clothed and i don't remember ever getting up taking my pajamas off putting my clothes on i hope i wasn't abducted that night <laughs> what country were you living in then i was in kenya back then um that's just that's the only time it's ever happened in my life just that one time so bizarre and by the way to the audience jim myers has the most interesting life and i'm not kidding you <laughs> of anyone I've ever met. And one of these days, he should just do a show about all the countries he's lived in and the jobs you've done because you got me enthralled one afternoon when we talked about it for hours, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> no, I probably should do that. Um, uh, I, I will take that to heart, Dave. Um, Let, let's, one switch more. Up, let's switch up from kids. Let's talk about Joe Carter at Mount St. Helens. Okay. Yep. Joe was on my list too. So. May 21st, 1950, 3 o'clock, Joe Carter was an engineer for Boeing in Seattle. And he was a national ski patrolman on the weekends. Now, if anybody knows, National Ski Patrol has to probably go through some of the most rigorous testing for you to yep. get on with them of any group. You got to be a super skier. kind Because you, you got to be able to find people in the backwoods of nowhere. And so uh, anyhow, uh, on that weekend, he and some friends decide that they're going to climb Mount St. Helens and ski down. And a lot of people did that at the time. Mount St. Helens right now is classified as a national monument or operated by the national park service. But he and some buddies go up there. He's 32 years old. He's in great shape. He's diabetic and they get to the top of the mountain. And Joe says, hey, I'll go down a little bit before you guys. I'm going to set up with my really nice camera. 
and I'll shoot you skiing down the mountain ahead of time. They said, great. So he skis slightly out of view. People wait a couple minutes. They come down and the place where they thought Joe would be, there's a packaging wrap from the film that Joe was mm. putting in his camera laying on the ground. And they could see where he had stepped there, but that's where wasn't there. But they see ski marks in the snow going downhill. And the people think, and they're looking around, they're not seeing Joe anywhere. And there's a big mountain there. And there's nobody on it but them. So they decide to follow these tracks down. And they went straight down the mountain. And what was described as a death-defying feat. And they said that he went over several crevasses. And one story said that his two skis went off the edge of a cliff straight into what was called Ape Canyon at the time. Another uh, story said that the skiing stopped at the cliff and then he walked off the edge. Either way, there was a massive search after they couldn't find him. And each of the people that were with him said Joe would never do that unless his life was in extreme danger. There were no other tracks in the snow other than his. And he was never found. Even though he had to go off this cliff, there was a two-week search down in Ape Canyon for the, his remains, which never were found. To me, this is one of those stories with Mount St. Helens because that area has been surrounded in strangeness forever. So he was skiing for his life, literally. That's what they Some, said. Something had scared him to death to make him do that. Um, and he's just, I mean, they were right there. They, you would think that they would have seen what he saw um, that scared him down the mountain, but that's a bizarre case. Now, for now the is this the same Ape Canyon as the Ape Canyon incident? Yes, yes it okay. is. Interesting. And if people don't know that, there was a cabin there with some prospectors that were in it that were supposedly attacked by some probably Bigfoot type creatures. And that was in that Ape Canyon area at the base of St. Helens. Wow. And St. Helens has just had a long history of strange disappearances I've written about. And this is one of those disappearances. They should have found his skis. They should have found him probably deceased. Right. But it sounds like something else happened here. And if it if there were no tracks, it almost has to be something aerial, an orb, yeah. UFO. You know, the question, could an orb have been chasing him? Why would you fear for your life from an orb? I don't know. I mean, I've seen orbs in the woods, and it certainly didn't prompt me to to run madly in the dark um but i mean anything is possible he saw something that he wanted to get away from it seems like um well, what if that orb could transform into something maybe but I mean, it, you really don't the know. way he was skiing you would think he thought it was right behind him and so um this question about the the Bigfoot bodies being removed after the eruption. I mean, those stories are out there. I've never been able to validate any of them. I don't know if you have, but um, yeah, that piles of Bigfoot bodies that were collected by the military. And, um, but it's like so many other things, it's so hard to get validation um, on a story like that like the Kandahar giants and other things that you hear the stories, people swear by them, but to find someone who, uh, to talk to someone who was there or who knew someone who was there is almost impossible. Um, what are your thoughts on portals here? This is a question. Well, the, uh, this person, Travis just brought up portals. What if he's standing there and a portal starts to open up next to him? Yeah. And it's coming towards them. I mean, there's yeah. every, I talk about this in my conferences, every theoretical physicist today believes that there's portals. Yeah. So 
who am I? I'm not that smart. They're smarter than me. And if they say they exist, I have to, I have to agree with that. And there's too many people that you and I know, Jim, that have seen those or seen yes. something like that. Yes. Something opening stories of, and your books of people hearing metallic sounds of things shutting in the woods that could have been a portal opening or closing um, or something from the ground opening and closing. Um, one of the other ones that interested me was, was Lorne. Um, oh, have you heard Lorne about uh, this question about cloaked traps in the forest? Have you heard that? Um, Never heard of that. Mm -mm, I haven't. Um, Lauren Bailey, I find interesting because uh, you mentioned these lava tubes, and I have some experience with those, which is what intrigued me about this story. But um, Lauren was, let's see, I got to look it up here. 16 years old. Yeah. Missing August 22nd, 1961 in Skamania County, which is just south of where we were just talking about. Uh, about 22 miles south of Mount St. Helens, 20 miles north of the Columbia River. Uh, Lauren was one of these kids that grew up in the woods. And what I'm going to describe to you about his behavior and what he did, you'd think it was crazy and you'd never let your 16-year-old do it. But his dad said, Lauren just grew up there. It, it was second nature to be in the woods. Well, yeah. he, had a, he had two friends. And one of them was on what's called Suan Lookout. And he had another one, another friend that was on another lookout miles away. And on the weekend, Lauren would go up and visit with each of the friends and go back and forth between the lookouts, just kind of being a talkative friend and saying what's going on. And he knew well, the path between them. There was no question about that. No, ne never a question. And um, after he went back and forth a few times, and there's 12 miles between each lookout. He didn't come back. His family was notified. It was a big search, huge search. Now, Skamania County has had a lot of strange stories related to Bigfoot and UFOs over the years. And, and lava tubes, too. But I don't think Lauren is one of those kind of people hmm. that could have been victimized by that because he knew the, the countryside yeah. so well. Now, one of the odd things that they found is they found an arrow drawn in the sand with a walking stick next to where this arrow in the sand was drawn. Now, what's interesting about that is that I've had other stories of missing people and searchers finding similar things drawn in the sand. Now, they never knew in the end if Lauren would have drawn that. And personally, I don't think he would have because I don't think he would have been lost. And that's, to me, that's almost indicative of like, hey, Dave, I'm down here fishing. Come, Come look this here. direction. Yeah. But uh, massive search. Lauren at 16 years old and 61, he was never found. And uh, his dad said, number one, he wouldn't have been lost in the woods. And he goes, I can't fathom my son dying in the woods. And then uh -huh. there were some other comments at the time saying, oh, yeah, well, he probably ran away. No, Lauren, Lauren didn't run away. He, his buddies were up there in the woods. Never found him. Well, here's the interesting thing about lava tubes. So when I, when I was uh, a kid growing up in Kenya, obviously you only find them around volcanoes. That's the lava tube. But the lava travels under the ground, creates these humongous tubes that, uh, the ones we used to explore in Kenya were as big, some of them as big as a subway tunnel. I mean, they were huge. And they would go back into the ground, some of them, and just stop. I mean, way back in the ground. Or you would follow a tube, and then it would open up, and there would be uh, a big opening in the ground, and there would be tubes, three more, four more, going off in different directions. So you never knew where a tube was going to end up, where it was going to take you. And um, there were a lot of people who got lost out at this volcano that I'm talking about. And we got lost the day we were out there and we almost died of thirst. Um, we found our way back 
finally at the end of the day, but we got lost in the morning and had no water till night and we were hiking the whole way. But, but it was these lava tubes that we couldn't, you know, and the only reason you would know there was a lava tube there was there would be trees sticking up out of the ground where there shouldn't be trees. And you'd walk over and look down and there was one of these big caves with the tubes going off. So, you know, if, if, something had taken him into one of these tubes um it's conceivable that no one would ever find him because i bet you no one's ever explored all those tubes on mount st helens um but yeah bizarre bizarre case um how many cases you got a two-person disappearance in here how many of those have you documented because i know there's not many very rare uh, usually one person is found. Uh, I've documented cases that are completely bizarre. One in New Mexico where uh, a father and his daughter were at a, uh, a national monument. And it was in an area similar to what you talked about, a volcanic area. And they disappeared. And it was like years later. They mm. found both of them laying next to each other. Skeletons, obviously. But both of them deceased. What doesn't make sense is that ye, people die at different intervals. We don't die right. at the same time. <laughs> right. And, and die and, right next to each other like that. No, that does not happen. Hmm. So the two that you wrote about here were Chris Hartunas and Raymond Vakili, um, who disappeared together and were never found, if I remember the story correctly. Um those were some of the most experienced mountaineers on Rainier. And they were, they were pulling uh, snow sleds behind them. They weren't, they didn't have ropes and carabiners and things, but yeah, those two guys, even the park service said that they couldn't come up with a rational way that both of them disappeared and weren't right. found. Right. Which is the whole point of going hiking with other people. Obviously the whole idea is that it's safer because you're not by yourself. And if you go missing by yourself, you know, people are going to have to find you at least with another person. It's so unlikely that both of you disappear. One of you can go get help. Um, and, you know, it's, it's again, two people. And, and the question, how often do people ask the question whether, um, I mean, I, I've heard stories about underground. I know there was that case you mentioned in. It wasn't. It wasn't uh, the UFO film, but it's the one you did with Dennis. I think it was on Shasta, where the guy was walking off on the snowfield. They should have seen him for forever, and all of a sudden he just disappeared, like he was swallowed up um, into the ground. Um, how many cases? have you investigated where that seemed like a possibility if the person just went in? You could say that almost about every case I've done, Jim. It, yeah, I suppose uh, so. The, in fact, in that Shasta case you're talking about, I interviewed the um, head search and rescue coordinator for the state of California that ran that search. And he said, Dave, we took a military helicopter up to 14,200 feet, the top of Shasta. We put eight of the best mountaineers at the top and they came down like a spider web. He's not on the mountain, Dave. Hmm. And he said, there's only two possibilities. He either went in or he went up. Yeah. But he's not on. No. And I thought, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who knows what's in that we don't know about? Um, that only comes out at times and maybe takes some of us. I don't know, but um, that's, yeah, that's frightening to think about because, you know, you and I are both in the woods a lot. And to think that of all the things that could happen to us when we're out there um, and, you know, people assume that Bigfoot's the only cryptid living in the woods. I don't think that's the case. I think there's a lot out there besides Bigfoot, uh, Dogman being one of them. And I, for one, would never 
want to meet a dog man because most of the accounts I hear about are not peaceful like many of the Bigfoot encounters where the Bigfoot appears and then disappears away through the woods. These dog man encounters are often very aggressive and and uh, tend towards violence. And I just think, yeah, I don't want to even have to think about that because I don't think even carrying a weapon would do you any good in most of those cases. Well, think about this. Remember how many years Ron Moorhead kept what hap- what was happening at his Sierra camp private and said nothing. Yeah. How many other of those type of camps are out there where people have these things happen to them and they just don't want to say anything? Yeah. And if Ron had never said anything, we would never be the wiser. And, and he even wrote about, like you said, he, he wrote about the voices without writing about all the bizarre things that happened in the camp. I think he was afraid of what people would think. Um, it was crazy enough that the Sasquatch were talking up there, but all the other things, the orbs and, the, um, you know, even him and Scott going up and having their horse turned upside down and jammed between two trees and it's just bizarre stories that you'd think, I remember when they when they told me some of these stories and I looked at Ron and I said, Ron, if you weren't the one telling me this story, I'd never believe you. These are so bizarre. So I mean, bizarre. He told, he's told this publicly before that in the middle of the night when all this stuff was happening, he said they clearly heard a car door open and close. Yeah. And I can tell you, I can tell you categorically that's impossible in under common common decency because you're 10 miles away from the nearest road yeah so what well, i've what been did... out i don't know I mean, it was imitating a sound how would it even know what that sound sounds like um if it was a sasquatch imitating it but i've been in the woods here and we were probably a mile from the nearest place that a car could even get to and it says 10 30 at night and i hear somebody hit their their fob to lock their car Bam! and i'm thinking there's no way there's no way a car could be out here where we are and yet somebody just locked their vehicle in the middle of nowhere so um yeah stuff happens in the woods you just can't explain um and you know what was that i have no idea i have no clue i have no clue um if I was anywhere else, I would have said somebody just locked their vehicle, but you're out in the middle of the woods and you hear things, um, or see things. I think maybe I showed you the picture of the, of the orb that we had one night that was way up in the tree. And you just think if somebody hadn't sh- sh- taken one, one snapshot, we'd never have known that orb was there. So, um, and then I took a picture 10 seconds later in the same place and there was nothing. So, uh, car door slam at Buffalo pass. Yeah. Here's a good one for you, Jim. Um, so on my videos on my channel, I get, I think I have 700 comments on my latest video. That's how many people are involved in making talking. And one of the comments today that came in and said, Dave, yeah, you've gone off the off the edge. Uh, <laughs> you're not talking about rational things anymore. I've got to leave. I said, okay, that's fine. I understand. But what I tell others when I'm at conferences and things is that if you don't have an open mind and you're unwilling to discuss mm. all the possibilities that have happened to others, what are we supposed to do? Just block it out and say, hey, I don't want to hear that. Like some researchers we know. Yeah. Or are you willing to listen to it and see how it all comes together in the grand scheme? Because these people that we're talking about are not liars. They're not people who are habitually liars. And so if they tell me something happened, Ron Moore had been a good example. Ron is salt of the earth. I can't imagine Ron willingly lying to you or me or anyone else. Um, but, uh, you know, if Ron says these things happen to him, I believe him at face value. Uh, and, but so many people would say 
Same thing to Ron. Well, you've kind of gone off the deep end now. Well, just because it doesn't happen to you doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It's like people who have been hunting their entire life. Um, <laughs> yes, you're you're one of many, many much more cautious hikers, hunters, campers now. Um, but and hopefully you carry a weapon and you have a personal locator beacon. But well, that um, comment right there, just so people know, I wrote a book just about missing hunters. It's probably one of my thicker books. So yeah. that comment coming from Jeff, I've heard that comment a thousand times. And a lot of times what happens to hunters specifically is many of them go out hunting together and they separate to hunt different areas. Well, under that profile point, it's called point of separation. Yeah. And when you separate, that's when something bad happens to one of you. And I never, I, I hunt with other people all the time, but I never hunt with them the whole time we camp together we go out and then we break and we split to go cover more ground and every hunter i know virtually does that and so um but you're right it is a point of separation and should one of us not come back to camp at the end of the night i would only have a vague idea where they went i mean we we kind of know we're splitting up in different directions but they could have gone anywhere in that direction so um, I've, I've been with a few hunters and they were late coming back and I thought, oh, great. Now we got another story for Dave's books and it's happens to be a friend of mine. So, um, you know, one thing I want to say, Jim, that I, on every podcast I'm on is I'm a huge advocate of everyone who goes into the woods has a personal locator beacon mm -hmm. and I carry one, Angie carries one and carry a sat phone and nowadays a lot of the new cell phones have a personal locator beacon activation within it so mm. that's even a backup but a personal locator beacon doesn't work off of cell towers it works off of satellites and it sends a message to the national oceanographic and atmospheric administration that they have an alarm and then they find the closest search and rescue and within 10 feet they can find you and I can tell you that thousands of people's lives have been saved because they activated these when they're in the woods. And what I, the best example is, is when you're a hunter, you don't hunt on trails. You're going cross country. Right. You're, you're going wherever. You break your leg and you're not on trail. There's a good chance you may not be found. That's why you always carry a personal locator beacon. I laugh when hunters say, oh, yeah, I spent $1,000 for my gun and my scope. And you're unwilling to spend $300 for a PLB. <laughs> Well, I, um, I always carry a handgun and I carry a Garmin inReach, which has, has the, uh, SOS button on it. Yep. Um, and if I were to push that button, even if I went missing and, and dropped that phone, they would find the phone, um, sooner or later. But, um, but yeah, I, I, um, how many people do you know, because now that you've written 12 books, people I'm sure come and tell you their own personal stories, but how many people um, have said that they, without the personal locator beacon, they would have been in serious trouble? You know, I honestly can't say that anyone's approached me saying that that saved them, hmm. but you can go to the sites where these things are sold and they have thousands of stories of people that have been saved directly because of these. And now people ask me, well, have you ever heard of anybody that disappeared having one? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I know of two stories where people have disappeared where they were carrying them. And they, it went off. They knew exactly where they were. They went there. They searched for a week, and they still couldn't find the person. But they knew where the beacon was coming from. Oh, yeah. Huh. Did they ever find the beacon? No. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole point is – they know where to look. Um, even if you moved after that, they have at least a pinpoint place to start their search. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm with Dave and encouraging everyone who's listening to be prepared when they go into the woods, uh, whether they're hunting or camping. Um, Doug Coho is a good friend. We've been out many times together in the woods. Um, well, Dave, thank you for being with me tonight. And uh, um, 
I'm excited you got your new book out and let's put that address up again, Steph. So people can make a note of it where they can buy Dave's book. Um, that's, that's our sister site. Just go to that site and then go to the online store. You can browse around on that site for probably a week with all, everything we have loaded on there regarding Bigfoot things. But, uh, Jim, it's always fun hanging out, talking. You bet. Well, I appreciate it. Um, just as a quick note, don't go to Amazon to buy Dave's books because people will buy them um, at Dave's site and then they will uh, up the price five times, ten times. And people think that's where they – I've heard of people paying 100 bucks for a book thinking that's what you charge and uh, that it's not what Dave charges. And, in fact, we sell them in our store – the same price as Dave does. So don't be fooled by people who are trying to upsell Dave's books at a exorbitant price. Cause you can get them from Dave at a, at a reasonable cost. So, well, Dave, thank you. Um, I look forward to, uh, you and I haven't been out in the woods in a long time <laughs> since you lived here. So, um, we've Wait, been you fishing came out here to Montana. You came out here yeah, to Montana. We, 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 went out. we went fishing, but, did we go out in the woods? We had a picnic in the woods. You, me, Daphne, and Angie. You're right. We did. I take that back. I went out in the woods with you two years ago. So. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. You had so well, much fun that day. Well, we had a blast. The whole week was a was an awesome week. And uh, <laughs> we're going to have to do it again. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in tonight. And uh, we look forward to... Next week, I'm going to have, um, finally, I'm going to have my friend, Dr. Alexander Graham, with his new book and the new evidence he's got on Bigfoot. You guys are going to want to tune in for that one. It's going to be quite a show. And as always, until next week, keep on squatching.